problem in the subject of creation versus evolution is that the meaning or definitions of certain terms is often misunderstood. For example, many people believe that changes which organisms undergo over time so that new species are formed constitutes evolution in action. Also known as the special theory of evolution, this is not evolution at all, but rather a great example of how the truth can be distorted. In reality, changes over time within kinds of organisms are adaptations brought about by natural selection. According to the general theory of evolution, all living forms in the world arose from a single unknown source, which itself came from an inorganic, in other words, non-living form, again, in violation of the law of biogenesis. So evolution requires the change of one kind of organism into another kind of organism. More specifically, the gradual change of, for example, fish into frogs, frogs into reptiles, reptiles into birds and mammals, and of course, the gradual change from some primordial soup into humans. The go-to-you via the zoo kind of evolution. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. More specifically, evolution requires the change from genetically less to genetically more complex, an increase in functional genetic information and complexity. New genetic information has to be added simply by natural processes. What is required is genetic changes that specifically code for new proteins, tissues or organs. So it is not simply change, but something which engenders greater complexity. They need new software. For the evolutionist, natural selection and random genetic mutations are the two main engines or mechanisms whereby evolution occurs. Then there are the terms micro and macro evolution. Micro means small and macro of course means big. Many people see the term microevolution as just a little bit of the process that they think turned bacteria into people. In other words, it implies that simply given enough time, millions of years, such micro changes will accumulate to amount to macro changes so that one kind evolves into another kind. On the other hand, there are people who say that they accept microevolution but not macroevolution. And in this way, they concede that a form of mini evolution takes place after all. Actually, these terms should never be used. The evolutionist believes that small genetic changes within a kind, wrongly termed microevolution, eventually led to, a, to major genetic changes over a long period of time, causing different kind of organisms to come into existence, macroevolution. According to the hypothesis, this is how one kind, a reptile, must have changed into another kind, a bird. But this is a type of evolution that has never been scientifically observed, not even in the fossil record. Changes do occur, this is true, but to define it as macroevolution, microevolution, or any kind of evolution at all, is to twist the truth just enough to mislead people. The terms micro and macro merely focuses on small versus large, effectively distracting us from the key issue, which is an increase in information. This particle to professor type of evolution, in other words, the gradual change from less to more complex, requires very specific genetic and thus biological changes within an organism. In other words, an increase in functional genetic information. Therefore, the question we should ask is this. In which direction are biological changes taking place? Are organisms becoming, becoming genetically more complex, according to evolution, or genetically less complex, according to creation science? Let's briefly talk about genes and things. It's important because genetics clearly show how one kind could never change into another kind, never have, 
never will. Few people realize that Charles Darwin knew absolutely nothing about genes because the information did not exist at that time. Every one of us have inherited certain characteristics from our parents. The color of our eyes, the shape of our noses and hands, the color quantity and structure of our hair, our temperament, certain diseases. This hereditary information is stored in the DNA molecule in every cell of your body in very small, very complex particles called genes. A gene is just the basic hereditary unit that occurs at specific locations on the DNA molecule within the nucleus of every plant and animal cell. And this hereditary genetic information is carried over from one generation to the next, which is why, why you may observe your nose on your grandfather's face. The DNA molecule is in the shape of a double helix structure or a double spiral and looks a lot like a twisted rope ladder. As we untwist the ladder, you will see how each side of the ladder is made up of nucleotide bases. These nitrogen bases are like letters in a very short alphabet, namely A, T, C and G, more precisely called adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. These four bases occur in different orders and combinations on the ladder. Nucleotide bases from one strand join with nucleotide bases from the other strand to form pairs or the steps of the rope ladder where adenine always joins with thymine and cytosine always joins with guanine. Three bases or letters in a row make up a codon, which is almost like a word. A certain sequence of codons, which may include dozens, hundreds or thousands of bases, is called a gene. Now this is like a chapter in a book. Interestingly, the sequence in which the base pairs occur in DNA forms a code that determines genetic information. In other words, it has meaning. In the same way as notes on a music sheet form a melody, the letters A, T, C and G form the foundation of genetic properties. DNA contains information for the manufacturing and functioning of every part of our bodies through this four-letter language. Let me repeat. A gene is therefore a specific portion of a DNA strand and it carries information for the manufacturing of a specific protein or the information for a specific function performed within the cell. A certain sequence of genes makes up a chromosome. This is like a single book. While all the chromosomes together forms your DNA, comparable to a whole series of books. Now you've just learned that the sequence in which the, the base pairs occur forms a code which determines genetic information. It has meaning. If information is found in a radio signal, such as instructions on how to build a very complex machine, no one would doubt that the transmission came from an intelligent source. Now DNA contains precisely such coded information, instructions on ho how to build a very complex machine. Yet the very same researchers acknowledging intelligence behind the radio signal will deny that DNA has an intelligent source, the creator God. Isn't that interesting? The capacity that DNA has to store information vastly exceeds that of any other known system. In fact, it is so efficient that according to Michael Denton, all the information required to specify the design of all the organisms that have ever existed on planet Earth can be contained in only one teaspoon, while still leaving ample space to store all the information in every book that has ever been written. Let me repeat. The individual nucleotide bases, like letters, make up codons, like words, which make up genes, like chapters, which make up chromosomes, like a single book, which makes up your DNA, which is like a whole series of books. In other words, DNA 
the complete set of instructions for making any one organism is not found within one long strand, but rather it is located in these multiple shorter strands or chromosomes. Each chromosome contains different genetic information. Except for the sperms and ovaries, each containing 23 chromosomes, human cells have 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. Therefore, it is all the information in all 23 pairs of chromosomes put together, which is the DNA of a human. And as mentioned, our DNA contains information for the manufacturing and functioning of every part of our bodies through this four-letter language. We now understand that evolution requires an increase in functional genetic information and complexity. And the mechanisms whereby evolutionists believe it occurs is mutations and natural selection. We look at mutations first and then at natural selection. But before we do that, I will briefly rep repeat this information. Every living organism in existence possesses a program, a set of instructions, much like a recipe, that determines, for example, whether the organism will be an ape or a human. It specifies the color of your hair, your eyes, etc. And all of this genetic information is stored within your DNA. Each human being's DNA is unique. And each and every one of us have been designed by the designer to carry this I genetic information forward to the next generation. You and I and every other human have 46 chromosomes. Of these, half, 23, come from your dad and the other half from your mom. These chromosomes organize into 23 pairs. The information is now recombined and sorted in various quite complicated ways and that leads to an enormous amount of variation. The amount of variation resulting from this combination is 70 trillion. This means that if your mom and dad were able to have a mere 70 trillion kids, not one would be an exact copy of the other. We've been designed to diversify. Keep in mind though, that this is a process where already existent genetic information is reorganized into new and specific combinations. No new genetic information is ever added. As this information is repeatedly duplicated letter by letter, to the following generations, mistakes sometimes happen. These mistakes are called mutations, and in most cases, it is associated with a loss of genetic information and complexity. Mutations are responsible for quite a number of hereditary diseases, uh, birth defects, as well as cancer, to name but a few examples. Over a thousand human diseases are now linked to mutations. Radiation is a well-known cause of mutation disorders because it can disrupt and change the genetic code so that other, sometimes even temporarily beneficial properties may originate. We will look at some examples shortly, but keep in mind that no new functional genetic information is ever added. This mechanism does not create anything new. Evolutionists are quick to point out that mutations can create new information. But the example cited by them almost invariably is evidence of new traits that are caused by the corruption of existing information. The issue here is not new traits, but new functional genetic information. Mutations can create new varieties of old genes, such as can be seen in tailless cats or blue-eyed people. But damaging mutations cannot be used to vindicate the molecules to man evolution. Because breaking things does not lead to higher function. Ed Lewis won a Nobel Prize in 1995 for discovering a small set of genes that affect different body parts called the Hox or the homeobox genes. They are a family of development regulating genes in animals, acting like architects of the body, since they direct where the legs and the wings and the antennae and body segments should grow. 
Many experiments have been performed on fruit flies where poisons and radiation was used to induce mutation. The problem is that these are always harmful. The mutation in these genes showed an extra pair of wings on a fly. But evolutionists failed to point out that they were a hindrance to flying because there are no accompanying muscles. These flies would simply be eliminated by natural selection. In other flies, the antennae pidae mutation caused legs to sprout where antennae should grow. There is no new information, but the mutation in the Hox gene resulted in already existing information being switched on in the wrong place. The Hox gene merely moved legs to the wrong place. It did not produce any of the information that actually constructs the legs. It did not produce any new functional genetic information. Even Down syndrome, a hereditary genetic dis disorder, which is the result of an extra copy of chromosome number 21, or parts thereof, does not demonstrate an increase in functional genetic information. Evolution requires new genes, new software, not copies of existing genes. When such a mutation mistake occurs, it is carried over to the next generation. Over time, these mistakes accumulate. In other words, the number of adverse genes increases. The organism does not become better, but rather it becomes weaker. Completely in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics and the fact that we are living in a fallen world because of sin. This increase in the number of mutations is known as the genetic load, genetic entropy. Now the effect of these mutation mistakes are not always visible. It is only visible if both parents carry the same mutation for a specific trait. For each specific trait, for example, the way in which your ears grow. You inherit one gene from your mom and another one from your dad. If one of the genes is faulty, there's always another backup gene from the other parent that still contains the normal and correct information. So if your mom's ear construction gene has a mutation problem, but your dad's ear construction gene works fine, you should have quite normal ears. However, if you inherited the faulty gene from both parents, you will not have any instructions for correct ear construction and your ears will be defective. The reason why your parents don't necessarily carry the same faulty genes or mutations pertaining to a specific trait is because your parents respectively inherited their genes from your grandparents. Thus, the effect of a faulty gene from one parent will not matter because the correct gene from the other parent will come into effect. A brother and a sister, however, will have a far greater chance of carrying the same faulty genes for a specific trait, for example, defective ears or sickle cell anemia or your ability to produce insulin. This is the reason why a brother and a sister should not get married. Because if they have children, the probability of uh, that malformations or and defects due to mutations may occur is greatly enhanced. And I know you don't even want to entertain that thought for longer than two seconds. And that is exactly how it's supposed to be. Th this is the reason why God so clearly forbade siblings to marry one another. But the question we should ask is when did God forbid this? I mentioned earlier how mutations accumulate. So as we move forward in generations further into the future, in other words, the longer the human race is on earth, the more mutation mistakes will be prevalent. And the further we look back in time into the past, the less genetic mistakes will have occurred. And if you look back to the time of Adam and Eve, to the time before they sinned, you will discover that there were absolutely no mutations in existence. Why not? Because God created them perfect. But because of Adam and Eve's sin, everything and I mean everything, was negatively affected. Even those tiny particles we refer to as genes. 
The first generations were not notably affected by this since the occurrence of mutations was still very low at that stage. It did, however, take hundreds of years and generations for these mistakes to accumulate to such an extent that it became dangerous for a brother to marry his sister. Which means, up to that point in time, Cain and his brothers could still marry their sisters. And I know, it freaks me out a bit as well. However, we accept that God created humans once in Genesis 1 and never again thereafter or before Adam and Eve. Since there were initially only two people on earth, the logical conclusion must be that Adam and Eve's children married each other. The Bible clearly states in Genesis 5-4 that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. And remember, Adam was 930 years old when he died. That is ample time to build a quite a substantially sized nation. And it's not as far-fetched an idea as you may be thinking right now, because Abram himself married his half-sister Sarah hundreds of years after the flood, which took place around 1,700 years after creation, yet there is no hint of any biological defects in the offspring. Genesis 20, 12. But indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Since the fall, there has been a gradual increase in mutations, genetic entropy, which explains why God only proclaimed specific instructions on this hundreds of years after Abram lived in the time of Moses. Leviticus 18.11, The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father, she is your sister, you shall, you shall not uncover her nakedness. Deuteronomy 27.22, Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. In fact, today it is known that mutations in humans are increasing at such a high rate that evolutionists are confused as to why we are not extinct yet. Dr. John Sanford, a Cornell University professor for more than 25 years, estimates that the average mutation rate per person, per person, per generation is at least 100 and probably about 300, possibly more. If we consider the, the rate of mutations today and accept that we've been on Earth for 100,000 years already, according to their hypothesis, we should already have been extinct 100 times over, according to the evolutionary geneticist Alexei Kondrashov. In his landmark book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, Dr. Sanford puts it as follows. So every one of us is a mutant many times over. Remember, evolution has proposed that mutations is one of the mechanisms whereby evolution, not extinction, is supposed to have occurred. Look, for example, at the shocking increase in birth defects under the Pakistani community in countries such as England. This contributed to the call for a ban on marriages between cousins. When first cousins marry, the chances of them carrying a disease-causing mutation is one in eight. The closer we are related, the greater the possibility that we carry the same mutations in our genes. It's important to remember that right and wrong is determined by our Creator God, not by our own opinions. It is obvious that God's instructions in this regard was given out of love, to protect us against the damaging effects of these mutations. Now it's generally accepted that the resistance to antibiotics by certain bacteria demonstrates at least some form of evolution. Although it is true that some bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, it certainly does not involve the evolution of complex structures such as eyes and ears. Despite this, some people still believe that it proves the fish-to-philosopher kind of evolution. Now, bacteria contains DNA information to form a certain enzyme when this bacterium is exposed to antibiotics. 
The enzyme transforms the antibiotics into a poison that kills the bacteria. Mutant bacteria do not contain this enzyme because the enzyme was lost due to a mutation. For this reason, the antibiotic cannot be transformed into a poison, so the bacteria survives. Can you see that a loss of genetic information occurred? However, when the population of bacteria is no longer exposed to antibiotics, the trend is that the more effective, non-resistant bacteria perform better than the mutants. Clearly, it does not demonstrate any sort of upward evolution. Moreover, the evolution of antibiotic resistance bacteria in response to antibiotics could never have taken place anyway because these resistant forms actually existed long before people developed antibiotics. How do we know this? Bacteria can survive being frozen. Some bacterial cultures that were frozen long before modern antibiotics were developed were defrosted and were already resistant to antibiotics. Mutations are copying mistakes, as mentioned earlier, and are usually harmful, sometimes deadly. Only in a few cases, and under special circumstances, it seems as though mutations may be beneficial, as with flightless beetles. In fact, one out of a thousand is a generous estimation for beneficial mutations. Now, the loss of wings in beetles that occur on a windy island is often presented as an outstanding example of evolution. However, the same beetles retain their wings on larger continents. So how does this work? A mutation can cause the beetles' genes to no longer contain the wing-making information because the information was either lost or damaged. The damaged gene is carried over to all the successive generations, eventually leading to a wingless beetle population. If this beetle occurred on the mainland, it would, not, it would have a competitive disadvantage since it won't be able to fly away from its predators. It is very likely that the beetle would be eliminated by the survival of the fittest concept before they can produce little wingless beetle babies. On the windy island, however, the wingless beetles will have a competitive advantage with their little feet planted firmly on the ground, while their winged beetle comrades are blown out to sea. Aha, says the evolutionist, here is an example of a beneficial mutation. Although in this case the mutation was beneficial, to the survival of the beetles specifically on a windy island, it still resulted in a loss of genetic information. Devolution, not evolution. Is there the slightest possibility that evolution can give organisms radically new abilities? No evidence has been provided for this audacious claim. Mutation-induced changes are rarely for the better. So to use an analogy, if a trader makes an average net loss of one pound a day over a long enough period of time, it will result in certain bankruptcy, not prosperity. Why won't evolutionists admit the startlingly obvious? Even if an occasional mutation happens to have an advantageous spin-off, it will be outnumbered by many more, as Moran herself admits, which have either no impact or a negative impact. Generations subsequent will continue this trend in precisely the same way and quite opposite to that predicted by evolution. Beneficial mutations are simply assumed to exist because Darwinian theories demand that they exist. However, only deleterious and functional mutations have been documented. We will now look at variation and natural selection, but let's begin with unnatural or artificial selection. Keep in mind that evolution requires a change from genetically less to genetically more complex. This increase in functional genetic information must happen purely through natural processes, specifically mutations and natural selection. Now, organisms were originally created with an enormous amount of variation built into their gene pool. 
Examples of this variation include the length of hair and horns and legs, the size of ears and the color of fur. This variation can be clearly seen in a, in a single litter of puppies. This gene pool can also be compared to a toolbox containing an abundance of solutions to solve present and future environmental problems. It is mainly in the form of the genes which are present but not always expressed or visible. Now humans have been breeding dogs for a very long time to select particular traits, particular genes. This selective breeding is simply unnatural or artificial selection. Although there are a very large variety of dogs today, dogs are still dogs. So what does it mean to select something? Well, by continuously breeding smaller dogs with smaller dogs, we might end up with a chihuahua. Or by continuously breeding larger dogs with larger dogs, we might end up with a Great Dane. The natural gene variety within their gene pool becomes diluted in the process. By only breeding with dogs that have the required characteristics, large or small size, long or short hair, etc., so that eventually Grey Danes no longer have genes for small size and Chihuahuas no longer have genes for large size. The unwanted genes have been selected out and they were lost together with a whole range of beneficial genetic variation when the previous dog generations died, consequently leaving both breeds with less natural gene variety in their gene pool than were present in the original kind from which they were bred. All the inbred or specialized dog breeds are actually poor in gene variety because the more they are inbred, the less gene variety of the original gene pool remains. Each selection causes a further reduction in variety of the original gene pool. The genetic toolbox is being emptied. And this is also the reason why these dogs have many genetic problems. German Shepherds and Rottweilers struggle with their hips, hip displacement, while race horses get sick very quickly. Now if, however, we could have a Chihuahua breed with a Great Dane, it would lead to an increase in gene variety but that may prove quite difficult. Natural selection is similar to selective breeding, except for the fact that nature now plays a role in the selection of genes instead of humans. The original dog or wolf kind had information for a wide variety of fur lengths. The first animal probably had medium length hair. Below each dog, a single gene pair is shown for a specific trait, in this case it's fur length, and these genes are in two possible forms. One form of the gene, the L, is for long hair, and the other one, the S, is for short, for short hair, short fur. Now in the first row, we begin to breed with animals that have medium length fur. Each of the offspring can inherit either gene from each parent to make up the two genes for this specific trait, hair length. In the second row, we see that the resultant offspring can have either short or medium or long hair. Now suppose the climate started to change by becoming drastically colder, such as during an ice age. Only the animals with long fur will survive and produce offspring, line three. From then on, all the dogs will be of a long fur variety. In other words, they are now adapted to the environment, more specialized that they, than their ancestors in row one, yet with less genetic variation in their gene pool, since no new genes were added, but genes were lost from the population when the previous dog generations died. And this happened because of adaptation through natural selection. This long fur population will not be able to adapt to a warmer climate in future since the genes carrying instructions for short fur had been lost. Let's look at a specific example. The Arctic wolf lives in very cold conditions beyond the Arctic Circle. They have thick coats, 
long, thick long coats, small ears and short legs to prevent them from losing too much body heat. The cold climate caused dogs with short coats, long legs and big ears to die out. And only dogs with long coats, short legs and small ears survived. Now these dogs had the correct genes in their genetic toolbox to adapt to this specific climate, giving them a survival advantage over animals without these genes in the same climate. One group of animals survived while the others died and together with them a whole range of genetic information. Here on our lovely warm African continent the wild dog has large ears, a much thinner coat and longer legs. A wild dog would never have survived close to the freezing pole areas because they are not adapted to a cold climate, while the arctic wolf would probably collapse and die from heat exhaustion in our lovely warm African country. Do you see how the climate contributed to the natural selection of dogs with the required genes to survive in two completely different environments? This is what we call natural selection. It is the survival of an animal that is best adapted to a specific environment through natural selection from the variety of already existent genes. While the one survives, another dies. To summarize, no new genes are added through natural selection, but genes have been lost from the population. This is the opposite of what evolution requires. The population is therefore now less adapted to future environmental changes. For example, if there was suddenly a warming trend in the polar regions, there is no genetic information for short hair available, which will cause the Arctic wolves to suffer severely due to heat exhaustion, and the reverse is true for the wild dog. The wolf will probably fry while the wild dog will freeze. Natural selection always reduces or eliminates genetic information. The genes are lost. Even though populations are more specialized, more species, more diversity, they have less genetic flexibility, bringing them closer to extinction. Now let's get back to evolution. Picture for yourself a dog that in addition to his four legs now also has a pair of wings coming out of his back. One thing's for sure, there is never a shortage of interesting fictitious examples when it comes to evolution where your imagination has no limits, just like a fairy tale. For this flying super dog to appear, the dog would require a whole new set of genetic information to be added to the existing DNA with which he was born. He would require information on the formation of feathers as well as the specialized supporting bone structures for the wings. Furthermore, he would require additional information in his brain to tell him how and when these wings should be used. If these wings are not 100% functional, it would not be an advantage and natural selection will remove it. DNA does not simply float around all around us. In other words, it has never been observed as occurring naturally on its own, nor has the addition of such new information to an animal's existing DNA ever been observed to occur naturally. Every kind of organism has been created with it. It is already contained within the organism's genetic toolbox. Dogs always produce dogs, not flying dogs. They can't have wings, neither can you, because their DNA doesn't contain the information for wing formation or the use of wings. Natural selection and genetic mutations are the proposed main mechanisms by which evolution is supposed to occur. Species are not static, they are not unchanging. There are various mechanisms including natural selection, mutations, unscrambling of pre-existing information, turning certain genes on and off, etc., which over time causes changes within plant and animal populations. But this can never change one kind of organism into another kind. When giving this more than a little thought, it becomes clear that without the introduction of novelty, the offspring will simply have the same basic features as the parents. One should always ask the question, in which direction did the change occur? 
Did information increase? Was new genetic information added? Or did it decrease? Did the change lead to a more complex kind of organism? Or did the organism remain the same, but with less genetic information, less complex? Natural selection always eliminates genetic information by reducing gene variety, while mutations never lead to an increase in functional genetic information. The two main mechanisms prove that evolution and increase in functional genetic information is impossible. So the next time you see a TV program where it's stated that evolution has taken place, you will know that no evolution took place. The question an informed person such as yourself should ask is this. Did they demonstrate the addition of new functional genetic information to the organism's DNA? If not, it is once again adaptation through natural selection incorrectly yet intentionally called evolution. To suggest that the informationally downhill micro change changes one observes routinely but erroneously used as proofs of evolution can accumulate over time to give the required uphill changes for microbe to man evolution is like a businessman arguing that many small losses will produce a profit given time. The observed changes do, however, fit a creation fall model well. By the way, changes over time within kinds is a scientific fact with which creation scientists have always agreed. The term natural selection was already described in the 1800s by creationist chemist and zoologist Edward Bly. That was 25 years before Darwin proposed natural selection as the way in which evolution must have occurred in the Galapagos finches. Research over the past 35 plus years has indicated that these changes, speciation, can happen quite rapidly and can even be reversed. Accordingly, millions of years are not required for speciation to take place. Blythe presented natural selection as a conservative, preservative factor. In other words, each kind remains the same kind, and this has been scientifically proven. While Darwin viewed natural selection as a creative factor, which was not scientifically proven, in other words, one kind changes into another kind. Stated differently, changes occur within kinds, in the various species also called speciation. But there is never a change of one kind into another kind. Creationists are often accused of believing in no change, or on the other hand, if they believe in change, this is misunderstood to mean changes between kinds. It should be made very clear that changes within kinds do occur, but there are no change of the kind into another kind, since there is a genetic barrier set up by the Creator which cannot be overcome and which is supported in all biological research. Biologists have identified several instances of rapid adaptation including guppets on Trinidad, lizards in the Bahamas, daisies on the islands of British Columbia and house mice on Madeira. Another good example is a new species of mosquito that can't interbreed with the parent population arising in the London underground train system in only 100 years. The rapid change has astonished evolutionists, but should delight creationists. This has also been experimentally verified. Gregor Mendel, a creation scientist's research on ordinary peas, provided clear evidence that changes are limited to happen within kinds, and therefore can never lead to the change of one kind of organism into another kind because of a genetic barrier that cannot be overcome. His work effectively refuted the basis for species evolution more than a hundred years ago. Darwin's idea is based on Lamarck's concept of hereditary acquired characteristics, whereby certain external features can cause an animal to change irreversibly, and this permanently acquired characteristics is then transferred to the offspring. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck 
laid the foundation of the modern evolutionary hypothesis with his concept of inherited acquired characteristics, Lamarckism. He stated, amongst other things, that the giraffe acquired its long neck by continuously stretching it to get to the highest leaves. Also that water birds grew webbed feet by themselves. Now, if this scenario were true, a man doing bodybuilding at the gym will have descendants that are born with bulging muscles, since he stated that these acquired characteristics were hereditary. Darwin further wrote that it seems to me almost certain that any ordinary hoofed quadruped might be converted into a giraffe. The Gerenuk gazelle in Africa has the longest neck in the gazelle family, as well as, as, well as a, a very long tongue, which he uses to reach the highest possible leaves while standing upright on his hind legs. Of course, he truly desires to reach the sweetest leaves right at the top. And how interesting that he still has not changed into a giraffe. And if you're perhaps wondering or thinking or under the impression that this outdated information is not taught to our children, have a look at your children's school books. This is a copy from my daughter's evolution notes. She is currently writing her record examinations in matric, the year 2017. So Lamarck's idea was tested by Wiseman, who was well known for the fact that he cut off the tails of 901 mites over 19 consecutive generations. In doing so, he refuted the idea of inherited acquired, acquired characteristics, or Lamarckism, since after 19 generations, the final generation of the mice's natural tails were as long as the original. By the way, if he purposefully selected mice with somewhat shorter tails and bred with them, he would have ended up with a slightly shorter-tailed mice population, just as we can see happening today with elephant tusks that have halved in length in the last century due to selective hunting and poaching. In the book you can read about peppered moths and Darwin's finches that are simply more examples of adaptation through natural selection, which is of course of no help to the evolutionist since there is still no change of kind. Now let's quickly touch on the survival of the fittest idea. An anopheles or malaria bearing mosquito species that becomes resistant to DDT which is a poison, will survive, while those that do not will become extinct. He did not evolve because he's still a mosquito. From the wealth of genetic information with which the mosquito was created, certain beneficial genes were selected in certain mosquitoes, enabling them to be better adapted to survive in a DDT environment better than others. The maladjusted mosquitoes died, and in the process, a large amount of genetic information was lost. Consequently, the gene pool is diluted since there is a decrease in genetic variation in this population, the opposite of what evolution requires. Natural selection cannot create, it can only eliminate. So what does survival of the fittest mean then? Look at the following circle and decide for yourself whether it is meaningful in proving evolution at all. Which mosquito is the most fit? Well, the one that survives. Which mosquito survives? The one that is most fit. So what was the created kind? According to God's word, the original kinds were created with distinct, separate gene pools, each kind with its own unique genetic toolbox. Each kind consisted of at least two members, male and female of the same kind, and they can reproduce fertile offspring. One kind, a cat, cannot mate with another kind, a dog, to produce fertile offspring. Now the biblical kind was bigger than the individual species of today, not necessarily in size, 
but because of the large amount of genetic information with which they were created. For example, the original cat kind had more than enough genetic information, far more than the cat species of today, such as the lions and the leopards and the cheetahs and domestic cats. The original elephant kind had enough genetic information to bring forth all of the various elephants, African, Indian, mammoths, mastodons, stegodons. Because the African elephant does not contain all the genetic information of the original elephant kind, you will not be able to produce a mammoth with the genetic information of an African elephant. In the same way, all the domestic cattle originated from just one kind, the aurochs. Taxonomy is the scientific field that deals with the classification of organisms. More precisely, taxonomists decide in which group organisms fit, and they also give names to these organisms. Now, a very well-known taxonomist was Carl Linnaus. He clearly indicated in his system of classification that there are no transitional forms, one kind gradually changing into another kind, but only clear, definitive categories, separate from each other, in other words, separate kinds only. Evolution teaches that all the species in existence, including humans, are the descendants of one original unknown kind, and they present this evolutionary process as a tree. However, there is not only one giant tree, but rather an entire forest full of trees, where each tree represents an original kind. So the evolutionary tree is out. Forests are in. According to creation science, every tree trunk in this forest represents an original kind, the original wolf-dog kind, the original elephant kind, cat kind, etc. While the branches and the smaller twigs represent all the subspecies and variations of that original kind. All these variations are still genetically related to the original created kind. Stephen Jay Gold, professor in geology and paleontology at Harvard University, said the following about the evolutionary tree. The evolutionary tree that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. In other words, everything below this green line is inference and not based on fossils. Remarkably, that which is above the line looks exactly like that which is proposed by creationists. The scientific names for plants and animals consist of two parts, the genus and the species name. The genus is like its surname, and the species is like its specific name. For example, the lion's surname and name is Panthera leo, while that of the leopard is Panthera pardus. Both are therefore classified under the same genus, Panthera, and both, together with all the other cat, all the rest of the cat species and variations, are also classified under the same family name, Felidae, the cat family. This is how it is done for all living organisms. In many cases, all the species that are descendants of this original kind will be grouped or classified under the same genus or family. So, there are more species than genuses, and more genuses than families, etc. The biblical record, the list of animals in Leviticus, indicates that the original kind was equivalent to the subfamily or family level of today's classification, at least with regards to birds and mammals. This has been scientifically verified through various documented case studies of hybridization between different species and genera. Creationist biologists generally use the term barrowman to describe the original kind. Now this diagram represents one of those trees in the forest. The very bottom row contains the original wolf or dog kind, probably at the family or subfamily level of Linnaeus's system of classification. The upper box of animals represents what we today refer to as species or sometimes genera. They don't naturally 
reproduce with each other, mainly because of behavioral or regional differences. For example, the change in a bird's call or a change in its color due to a mutation may cause other members of the population to no longer recognize him as a mate of one of their kind. Strictly speaking though, reproduction is still possible between species because all their genetic information originates from the original dog-wolf kind. In the November 2002 Journal of Science, it was confirmed that all dogs are descendants of wolves. The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We examined the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 dogs, representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. In other words, a group of living organisms, wolves, dogs, foxes, etc., belong to the same original kind on a family or subfamily level if they are descendants of that same original gene pool. And we can test it. A horse and a donkey can crossbreed to bring forth a mule. So they are of the same original kind. A zonkey is a cross between a zebra stallion and a donkey mare. Wolfens are a cross between a whale and a dolphin. And a liger is a cross between a male lion and a female tiger. Ligers therefore prove that lions and, and tigers are different species but of the same kind. Wolfens prove that wh whales and dolphins are different species but of the same kind. All these crossbreeds therefore prove that they originate from the same original kind. Note, however, that although many of them produce fertile offspring, it is also true that crossbreeds are mostly sterile. Some creationists have proposed that because these hybrids are sterile, the horse and the ass and the zebra must be separate created kinds. But not only does this go beyond the biblical text, it is overwhelmingly likely that horses, asses and zebras, there are six species of equis, are the descendants of one created horse kind which left the ark. Hybridization itself suggests this, not whether the offspring are fertile or not. Infertility in offspring can be due to rearrangements of chromosomes in the different species, changes where the various species have the same DNA information but the chromosomes of the different species no longer match up properly to allow the offspring to be fertile. Such non-evolutionary changes within a kind can cause sterility in hybrids. The fundamental reason why the created kind must at minimum be at the generic and not the species level is that the genus is the smallest division of plants and animals that can be identified without scientific study and this makes sense because Adam was not a taxonomist. God pre-programmed the original kinds with enough genetic variation to enable them to adapt to a wide range of environmental changes after the flood. The more variation, the more variety in the gene pool of the original kind, the fuller the toolbox, the greater variety of the same kind eventually came about. This led to the enormous variety of species today. The genetic information of all these varieties still come from the same particular original kind. The offspring of fish are still fish. Frogs are still frogs. Apes are still apes and humans are still humans. Although great variation exists within these kinds. Based on the species level, of the standard classification system, it would seem as though there are far too many animals, too many animal varieties today than could possibly have fit onto the ark. These, however, are only varieties of the same original kind on the family level of classification that was on Noah's ark. In another presentation, we'll learn more about the logistics of Noah's ark. 
Genetics and the study of DNA provide clear evidence that one kind can never change into another kind. kind. God pre-programmed the great variety of living organisms within their genetic codes, each having their own unique, immiscible DNA recipe. God designed the basic kinds to reproduce only with their own kind, not with any other kinds. Accordingly, a dog and a cat cannot interbreed to form a new creature. The fantastic range of genetic variety within all the original kinds is more than sufficient to explain the variety and number of living organisms on Earth today and to enable them to adapt to various environmental conditions. It may surprise you to hear that some evolutionists are now rejecting the concept of the evolutionary tree of life, as clearly stated by the cover story of the New Scientist 2009. The tree of life has turned out to be a figment of our imagination. The problem involves the passing of genes from one organism to another without sexual reproduction, which may occur in bacteria, for example. However, there is nothing here to support the evolution of new kinds of plants and animals, or even microorganisms, and evolutionists are not rejecting evolution. As the New Scientist article states, downgrading the tree of life doesn't mean that the theory of evolution is wrong. It's just that it's more complicated than Darwin imagined. Evolution is clearly loaded with fairy tales that are believed by children and adults alike. Do you still remember the frog that changed into a prince? Is that still a fairy tale today? Well, just add a few million years and they call it evolution, the pioneering science. I want to repeat the words of Professor Louis Bonua. Evolutionism is a fairy tale for grown-ups. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the age of the earth, sedimentary strata and fossils. Thank you.